Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 229. For this one, we're playing 510 at Bellagio. Get into a ton of interesting situations. You guys are gonna love it. But before we get started, a couple of announcements to make. The first one is that we're doing a meetup game November 17th at Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida. That one will be a blast. I have more information in the description box below. And then to kick off the WPT World Championship in December, Andrew and I are hosting a meetup game at the win on December 1st. Doyle Brunson's gonna be there. Uh, a bunch of the WPT team is gonna be there, including Tony Dunst, Lynn Gil Martin, Vince Van Patten, and, uh, and then there's gonna be some other special guests that I can't quite announce just yet, but I have more information in the description box below for that as well. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. The Five Diamond is going on right now at Bellagio. It's one of the most prestigious tournament series in all of poker. I'm looking forward to playing the main event in several days, but for now, I'm ready to get back in the cash game streets. It's very early in the morning before Las Vegas Boulevard is packed with tourists. We arrive at the property. For a little while, we've got the conservatory all to ourselves. I've always loved being awake when the rest of the world is asleep. Finally, we get to the poker room where there's one game of 510 going at this hour, and to be honest, it's not particularly great. It's a handful of some of the winningest players in Las Vegas who don't want to give in to sleep just yet. Meanwhile, I'm coming in fresh after just waking up. If I were game selecting, perhaps I'd pass on playing at the moment, but I've known the guys we're battling with for a while. Half the table has been in previous higher stakes vlogs. I'm looking forward to catching up with them after mostly being out of town for several weeks leading up to today. We buy in for 1500 that's the max. The session begins at 547 in the morning. 40 minutes in, we pick up pocket aces under the gun plus one. I raised to 30. A player named Nick went to one of our meetup games at South Point years ago and is now regularly playing 100-100 in Bobby's room, three bets to 120. He picked a bad time to do that. Nick just lost a pretty big hand and hasn't reloaded yet. I consider flatting in position to potentially let him fire away into a trap that we set for him. Instead, I play it straight forward with a four bet to 300. It's only two and a half times the size of the three bet in order to make calling a very attractive option. It's also an amount that leaves some room for the opponent to put in a five bet jam as a bluff if he thinks that we don't have what we're representing and maybe we'll fold for 620 more. We do have it though. The small blind is suspicious of our play but he folds what he'd later tell me is 7-6 suited. Here we've got ace-3 suited in middle position. No, you're not that drunk. The cards are just blurry because I got this new iPhone that I'm filming with for the first time today. And I have no idea how to get it to focus on what I want at the moment. All the camera's default settings are not conducive to making poker vlogs. In fact, I'm spending a lot of time this session trying to figure out how to turn this new iPhone 14 into my previous iPhone 10. Nearly everyone is straddling except a player named Randall Lay because he likes being difficult. He's probably related to a bunch of my ex-girlfriends and people who work at the DMV. Nonetheless, the straddle is on this hand. I raised a 50. The same guy who 3-bet me in the ace's hand hasn't learned his lesson. He 3-bets again, this time from the big blind to 160. This is the chart from the course Smash Live Cash that shows what we're supposed to do for middle position in a game with no rake when a straddle is on and when we get 3-bet by the big blind. It's one of 4,808 preflop charts that comes with the course. I've never seen anything as extensive as this that covers so many different preflop scenarios. I have a link down below in the description box if you'd like to purchase the course that comes with these charts and way more. We see here that when we're facing a 4.6x 3-bet sizing, we should mostly fold ace-3 suited while mixing in a small sliver of 4-bets as bluffs. The opponent in this instance used a much smaller sizing of about three times my initial raise size. Because of that, and the fact that we're in position, I can justify calling more frequently since I'm getting a decent price. I call for 110 more, we're heads up, the plot comes 10-4-3 with two hearts, we've at least got a pair. The big blind down bets to 100. There's no way that we're folding a pair. I call to see how the opponent's going to play future streets. The turn is another 10, this card freezes the big blind, he checks. We have a hand with a decent amount of value that we don't need to turn into a bluff. I check back. The river is the jack of clubs. The big blind checks one last time. Still, no need for us to bet because worse hands likely won't be calling and better hands won't be folding. I check back hoping that we're up against ace king or ace queen. The big blind shows big slick. We show that we outflopped him to get the win. It's a friendly table. We all know each other. I'm instructed to let you guys have a glimpse of the person's world we've been wrecking so far in this video. Yeah, get his face in too. <laughs> this is Nick. If he looks familiar, it's probably because you recognize him from episode 98 titled Cracking Aces Twice, Most Ridiculous Hand I've Played, in which I cracked Nick's aces twice in a double board bomb pot in the most ridiculous hand that I've played. 
Nick's hands can also be seen making an appearance in episode 186 when he set over sets us in the uncapped 1020 game and makes the minimum. He's done great so far on the vlog. An hour goes by, we've got Ace-5 suited under the gun, the straddles are no longer on as frequently, I raised to 30. A player named Jeff, 3 bets to 110 from the hijack, Jeff actually went to a meetup game way back when we were doing them at Westgate 5 years ago. You may remember him from more recent vlogs such as episode 158 titled Ready for Nosebleeds, 60,000 on my left, when he was the guy who had 60,000 on my left. This was during a period of time when Jeff would buy into the games with his whole bankroll at risk. If you're wondering how that strategy panned out, look no further than the fact that Jeff is now playing 510. He's doing great tonight though, he's got about 7,000 in front of him, that amount might also be his entire bankroll. We've got a hand that we'll mix in calling and 4-bet bluffing with. We choose the more aggressive option and 4-bet to 400. Our line looks incredibly strong, especially considering our position. It doesn't phase Jeff. He calls for 290 more. That's alarming. If we don't connect in a big way, I may just shut down. We're heads up out of position in a big pot. The flop comes Jack-9-3 rainbow. We don't even have a backdoor flush draw. Jeff is going to have over pairs and sets. We've got absolutely nothing. This is a rare instance on the vlog when I throw in the white towel. I check. Jeff isn't checking back, he puts in a tiny bet at 200. There's very little chance that we're not in extremely bad shape, likely drawing dead to 3 outs or just to a backdoor straight or backdoor trips. Jeff could have a lot of strong hands or even something like Ace King that has me in terrible shape. I fold, it hurts me to quit on a hand like that, but it's the right thing to do. She's giving up. Jeff, what do we have here? Oh, you get a hand for the block. Wow. A good hand. <laughs> Fucking check awesome. I had ace five of hearts. <laughs> Jeff shows for you guys that he had the trap laid out nicely for me. Luckily, I do well to evade it. Jeff still gets $400 that I torched preflop. You know who doesn't have any of my money today though? Nick. We pick up ace king offsuit in the big blind in the straddle pot. Nick raises to 50 in the cutoff because he can't help himself when he's dealt two cards with either numbers or letters on them. The button calls with a short stack. We probably have the best hand. We need to make it more. I three beds at 250. Nick is over it. He folds. The button surprisingly calls, leaving himself with only 340 behind. It's substantially less than a pot size bet. It's going to make for an awkward situation if I don't make a pair. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes 753 with two diamonds. We completely miss. All we've got is two overs and a backdoor wheel draw. The question is, what do we do now? We could still have the best hand, so I'm not going to be check folding to a jam. Plus, if we don't currently have the best hand, we may have around 25% chance of winning the pot if the opponent has something like pocket eights. Since the button doesn't have much left in his stack, I decide it's best to see if he wants to play for all of it. All right, I'm on. All of it. We don't have to sweat for long. The opponent snap folds. We probably did have the best hand. With this win, we go from being just barely stuck to being up 300. We're looking to add to our profit when we pick up pocket kings on the button just 15 minutes later. Rain delay opens at 30 in the hijack. I haven't battled with him too much other than in a 10-20 session at Aria earlier this year that was covered in the vlog. He's got perhaps the best nickname in poker. We're going to be 3 betting. I make it 100 to go. Ordinarily, 100 might be enough to win the pot immediately. Rain Delay is ready to play ball though. He 4 bets to 350. The opponent started the hand with 1635. We have him slightly covered. I consider 5 betting, but I don't think that we'll get many worse hands to call. I also think there's a good chance that we're up against pocket aces. We don't want to inflate the pot if we're up against rockets, and we want to make sure that hands like queens and ace kings stay in. I just call for 250 more. I've got a not so great feeling about this one. We're heads up in position. The flop comes 10 8 6 with two spades. We've got an overpair to the board, and we're still beating hands like ace king and queens. There aren't really any hands that rain delay would have four bet me with that would have improved on this flop, so the only hand in rain delay's range that we're losing to is still aces. He checks. After seeing that, my confidence in Cowboys raises quite a bit. I bet 300 to entice a hand like Ace King to call one time, though it'll have very few outs. There's no call. After about 40 seconds, Rain Delay announces that he's all in for 1285 total. My confidence level drops. I could still be up against Queens or a hand like Ace King of Spades, perhaps another bluff of some sort. I can't fold, but I'm not fist pump getting it in either. I mean, I think you just, I, I call. I think you had me beat, but. Good luck, guys. Uh, I probably do. Yeah, you have aces? Yeah. That's why I just flatted. Nice sand, nice sand. Must be nice, Dan. <laughs> I've been waiting for something like this to happen. It's been too long since the last storm. 
These kinds of losses don't bother me as much when there isn't really anything that I can do differently. When I try to force things or pick bad spots that I could have avoided that caused me to lose money, that's when I get most frustrated with myself. In this instance, I add on for 1300 more and try to move on without getting too flustered. Feels like today it may just be my day to get wrecked though. Less than 15 minutes go by when we pick up Ace King suited in the big blind. Under the gun raises to 30. Jeff is in middle position. He calls. Jeff has a massive stack of about 9,000. We're in an attempt to heist to steal some of his chips. I three bet to 160. Under the gun folded before the bet hit the felt. Jeff apparently doesn't have too difficult of a decision. He takes some chips from his tower to call pretty quickly. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes queen 10 3 with two spades. We've got a gutter ball and two overs. When Jeff flats the initial pre flop raise and then my three bet, who have a lot of low to medium sized pocket pairs, maybe some suited connectors and Broadway hands too. I bet 200 is a semi bluff to get his pocket pairs that didn't improve to fold. This bet doesn't accomplish what I'd hoped. Jeff calls. I don't like it. The turn is the ace of hearts giving us top top. The issue is that king jack makes it straight and we could still be up against ace queen or ace 10 suited. I check for pot control purposes. I don't want to see the opponent make a substantial bet. He checks back. I love seeing that because it means we probably have the best hand. Maybe up against a draw of some sort or just one pair. The river is the king of spades. It's the worst two pair card that we could hit. Not only does the flush draw get there, but there's also four of the straight on board. I check. Another check back would be great. We don't get it. The opponent bets 200. It's about a quarter of the pot. I'm getting almost five to one on a call. I'm not good enough to fold. I match the bet. Jeff shows that he takes me to value town for the price of a Nintendo 64 when it first came out with Jack 10 of diamonds. A lead change occurred on every street that ultimately ends with the rich getting richer. I add on for 300 more, then the floor tells us the entire table has to move to another part of the room because soon they're going to start some tournaments where we're currently sitting. We pick up 8-7 suited at the new location. I raise to 30 for middle position. The hijack calls. I predict the cutoff will be getting cold for Christmas. There's no way he's making the nice list after he 3 bets to 130. Real dick move by him. At least our hand has a lot of potential. We're stuck. We call for 100 more. The hijack folds with her nice nails. It's down to heads up. We're out of position. The flop comes 10 7 4 rainbow. We've got middle pair and a lot of backdoor capabilities. I checked at the pre flop aggressor. He's not going to be slowing down too much. He keeps the pressure on with a bet of 100. There's no way that we're folding. I'm going to be mixing in calls and check raises. There are so many cards that'll help our hand, including sevens, eights, clubs, plus any jack, nine, six, or five will give us a straight draw. With so many ways that we can improve, we don't necessarily need to turn our hand into a bluff while we're getting a good price. I call with plans of potentially check raising the turn. The dealer puts out the ace of clubs giving us the flush draw. I check once again. There won't be an opportunity to check raise this time as the opponent checks back. He may be doing this for pot control with a hand like ace queen or ace king. He might also have something like pocket kings or queens. We don't hit the back door flush. The river is the eight of spades giving us two pair. It's even better. We've got an extremely strong hand that the opponent likely doesn't expect us to have, particularly in a three bet pot. When we're in these types of situations with a hidden monster, I like betting big and going for the home run. I make it 400. There's no quick decision from the opponent. He must have a hand with at least some value. It's a polarizing bet that the cutoff is facing. After he checked back the previous street, I turned plenty holdings into a bluff. The opponent isn't quite able to make the call. He folds. I like the guy. I let him know that we got there on him. I never really mind showing people at the table what I have because it's so unlikely that we're going to be in the exact same situation again. 30 minutes later, we pick up 8-7 suited in middle position. I raise to 30. I predict the Easter Bunny will be skipping the cutoff's house in a few months after he 3 bets to 110. Not a cool move by him. Not cool at all. At least we can make some big hands with suited connectors. We're still losing. We call for 80 more. It's heads up. We're out of position. The flop comes ace king seven with two clubs and a spade. We've got a pair and some backdoor potential. I checked to the cutoff. This is actually a much better flop for the three better than in the previous hand because there are two Broadway cards out there. The cutoff loves giving us discounts. He down bets to 80. I'm not considering putting in the check raise this time because the cutoff has a major range advantage given the hill have sets of aces and kings plus ace king combinations that I won't have. The best hand that I'll have is a set of sevens. It's still too early to give up just yet. I call to see how the turn plays out. The dealer puts the five of diamonds on board. That's not a fun one that helps us at all. I check with plans to give up if we face a bet. We don't face one though. On a brick turn, the cutoff checks back, which reveals a lot about the strength of his hand. If he had a set, two pair, or an ace, I would have expected the opponent to fire again on the turn. Since he didn't even attempt a bluff, he probably has a hand with some value, but not much, like pocket queens. 
We're going to be betting nearly every river card, especially this one. It's seven of hearts. We make trips on an ace high board in a three bet pot with eight seven suited after the club flush drop bricks and it checks through on the turn. It's pretty rare that we play a hand that's so similar against the same opponent within a 30 minute time frame. The key difference in this instance is that the opponent checked back on a turn that shouldn't have changed much, so it's way less likely that we're up against top pair. We still have hidden trips, so we'll be betting a significant amount, but the only way that we'll get called is if the opponent wants to bluff catch. I bet 450 to really punish any non-believing. The cutoff folds immediately, he probably had queens or jacks and wasn't happy with the flop. I can't help but let him know that we got there again on him with 8-7 suit. Pretty much the same hand, man. We're winning some medium-sized pots, but we're in for 3,100 total on the day, so we're still down a significant amount. Some work needs to be done if we want to get back to even or potentially make a profit this session. The table agrees to do a bomb pot. All eight of us put $30 in pre-flop, then go straight to a flop. We've got king eight of hearts under the gun plus one. It'd be great if the phone would focus on the cards properly, but it hates me like my girlfriend's youngest daughter did when I first met her. Hate's actually a strong word. I shouldn't say that. She would just sometimes say right in front of me, Mom, can you tell Brad to leave? The flop comes ace nine deuce with two hearts. We've got a draw to the nuts. It checks to the hijack who we love battling against with suited eights. He bets 130. Jeff is in the cutoff. He's not ready to go anywhere. He calls. I'm certainly not folding. I call. Three of us make it to the turn. It's the five of spades putting a second flush draw on board. No help to us. I check. The hijack perhaps didn't like getting called in two spots on the previous street. He checks. There's very little chance that he has something better than one pair. The cutoff checks back. There's no way that he has better than one pair either. If we don't improve on the river, we may turn our hand into a bluff. The final card is the 10 of diamonds. The only way that we can win this at showdown is if somehow the other two players both happen to have flush draws that didn't make a pair. It seems incredibly unlikely that king high is good, but the opponents left the door open for us to wrap a big hand when they checked behind us on the turn. I can have plenty of two pair hands, maybe four three hearts or spades that turn to straight, maybe even a set of aces occasionally. As long as neither of my opponents river two pair, I should be able to steal this one if I make a bet large enough to fold out one pair combinations. I made some big bets with strong hands in recent memory, and even showed my cards when I didn't have to. I attempt to cash in on the credibility that I built up here. 700. 700. The hijack folds right away. We just need to get through Jeff. He suspects something may be up. It feels, I mean, it feels exactly where you meant to make it, which is polar. <laughs> huh. Never happened. Like nine, ten of hearts. Oh, God. It's good to see Jeff in the tank. He for sure just has a one pair hand. If he calls, we'll be stuck over 2100 on the day. If he folds, we'll only be down a manageable 800. Our fate depends on Jeff's decision. He seems like he's on the verge of folding. I'm rooting for it. Finally, he mucks. Nice. All right, we got one through. Oh, uh, no, no. <laughs> Jeff got us with the aces earlier, then again with Jack-10 suited. I've got two words for him. Revenge. You know who I haven't gotten revenge on? is Rain Delay. We get an opportunity with pocket queens in the small blind. Rain Delay raises to 30 from the cutoff. That amount won't quite be enough to see the flop. I three bet to 120. If we get four bet again, that'd be rough. Rain Delay calls. We're both deep. It's heads up and we're out of position. The flop comes 7-4-3 rainbow. I like that there's no ace or king out there, but it's pretty coordinated and I rarely have anything better than one pair in this scenario. Rain delay could have all the sets or even a hand like pocket fives, which will have plenty of equity. I check mostly for pot control purposes. Rain delay apparently likes his hand enough to bet. He makes it 100 to go. I'm okay with that price. I call. We could still be up against medium pocket pairs that we're beating or even high card hands. The turn is the deuce of hearts. It's probably okay for us if we were ahead previously. I'm somewhat flying blind here after check calling the flop. I check again. If we see another bet, I'll start getting worried that we could be up against a monster. The cutoff fires for 370. There's a pivotal moment in the hand. One wrong move could cost me my whole stack. The adrenaline is pumping. There's really no better time to show you how elegant the ceiling is though. They do a phenomenal job here and the ceiling guy needs to get more credit. Back to the hand because this is important. I know that this board isn't great for me. Rain Delay knows it as well. Is he bluffing with air, or is he actually strong enough to be betting a sizable amount on the turn after calling my three bet pre-flop and betting on the flop? He's representing hands stronger than one pair. If I call here, I may face a way bigger bet on the river. It could be up to two times the size of the pot or more. 
or worry about that if it happens. For now, I call knowing that there are very few cards that I'll want to see. The river is the eight of clubs. I check again while wondering how much the opponent's going to make it. The ball is in rain delays court, and of course, we're going to have to wait a little while. Eventually, we get a miracle check back. We've got to be good. I happily turn over the queens. Rain delay explains that his hand ended up being too good to fire a third bullet as a bluff. I was kind of excited to see what was going to happen if I bricked off, and I rivered a pair, so. Rain delay doesn't show the table what he has. He'd later tell me that he had 8 5 suited and made an extremely light 3 bet call pre flop and almost pulled the trigger on a triple barrel bluff that had showed on value a top pair, so we checked it back. It's a huge win for us that almost gets us back to even. There's a football game on that I want to watch, so I'm ready to head out with a small loss. Despite Rain Delay winning a lot more for me today than I won from him, he decides to ruin the rack up shot. No, no. Fun session today, man. That was like one of the most fun sessions I've played in a long time. Uh, I've known those guys for a while uh, and we were just talking and hanging out and uh, 510 is really kind of the stakes that I enjoy playing the most. So was had that aces versus kings hand and doubled up rain delay in that one and uh, just thought I was going to have a big losing session. So to come back and only lose 100 and was it $160 it's pretty awesome and so that feels like a big win uh, time to watch Niners Falcons game and uh, I'm gonna be back here soon for a meetup game in a couple days that's it for this one guys I hope you enjoyed it if you did I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe button because it helps out the channel a ton if you have any questions or comments feel free to let me know in the comment section I'm happy to get back to you this was uh, just a fun session for me. I, I really enjoy playing 510 at Bellagio. Um, it's kind of, you know, one of the places where I feel most comfortable. And uh, I, I like playing with that group of guys. And they told me to roast them in this video. And so I did my best without going too overboard. But a uh, few announcements, guys. Don't forget to, to come out to the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino for the meetup game on November 17th. Um, and then December 1st, we're having that awesome meetup game at the win with Doyle Brunson, just an absolute legend of the game, a bunch of the WPT crew, and then uh, a few other big names that I'm excited to share with you once I get the green light to do that. But that's gonna be one that you absolutely won't wanna miss. And then that's to kick off WPT World Championship Series that's taking place basically all of uh, December. So um, that's where I'm gonna be playing and uh, yeah, hope, hope you guys are all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Good luck at the tables, and I'll see you next time.